Hello, we're here with Representative Mike Pellicciotti, and uh, he is running for Washington State Treasurer. Would you like to uh, go ahead with your two minute introduction? Well, thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join all of you uh, today. Uh, you know, I won't uh, go into too much. I know I had a chance to, to speak to the 36 uh, before, and I appreciate the opportunity to join the uh, uh, endorsement panel uh, today. You know, what I will say is, is this, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of you uh, might remember four years ago, uh, you know, we, we had a situation where in an open seat, we had three uh, Democrats uh, run for state treasurer, two Republicans. And uh, at the time, uh, you know, the, you know, as we know particularly well, you know, in light of a uh, good campaign run by uh, one of the members of 36, John, John Comerford, um, you know, that, that uh, you know, unfortunately the votes were split and, and the two Republicans went on to the general election. Um, and so as a result, we have a Trump supporting Republican incumbent state treasurer that, that I am taking on. Uh, you know, when I first ran uh, for the legislature in, in 2016, I took on a multi-term Republican incumbent that year. Um, I did then, which is what I do now, which is I, uh, one of the re main reasons I first ran for office and continue to, to run for office to get corporate campaign money out of politics. Um, and, you know, I uh, was one of the first and, and still one of the only uh, state elected officials who has never taken any corporate donations. And there is uh, no position uh, in my mind where it is more critical to not have corporate campaign entanglements uh, than the position that is responsible uh, directly or indirectly for investing over $100 billion, $100 billion of, of public funds. And uh, it's very important to have someone with clean hands in that position. You know, I've been able to lead on a range of issues to get dark money out of politics, to get rid of foreign corporate donations, and uh, have more PAC transparency. And I'm going to continue seconds. to work on those issues um, uh, while the, those transparency issues as state treasurer. Great. Thank you. Uh, so now Mackenzie will post into the box the four uh, prepared questions that we have for uh, state treasurer. Um, and we will go in this order. I have uh, Liz, then Summer, um, then Mackenzie, then Laura. So as soon as we... You know what, Nicole? Mm -hmm. You may want to go ahead and skip me because I only see the questions for like two seconds on my phone. Oh, okay. Um, there, I'm seeing it now. I don't know if it was stay up. Okay. Nope, it's gone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So, right. so Summer, Mackenzie, Laura, Sherry. Um, Summer, would you go ahead with question one? Yes, uh, it's question one seems to be listed here twice. So <laughs> I will read it the first time. <laughs> Do you support the creation of a state bank? Sure. Well, you know, as I was just mentioning, one of the Main reasons I went into politics uh, was to get uh, corporate influence out of politics, and you know, being what would be the first uh, uh, state treasurer in modern days to not accept any corporate money, it goes without saying. One of the absolute priorities I have is maximizing the return of of, of money and profits uh, to to taxpayers, and making sure that that we're doing everything we can to do that. It's it's one of the reasons I, I voted for. Um, the budget that included uh, Senator Kuderer's plan uh, to uh, put together this bit, a business plan, a task force related to, uh, you know, looking into exactly that issue. Um, and it's one of the things that, that, that I supported uh, in, in supporting the, the budget related to that. We were coming super close to getting some, some direction uh, from that. And it's one of the things that I'd like to see happen because we, we need to do what we can to increase infrastructure investment. And, you know, one of the things that was uh, unfortunate is that the governor, um, at the request of our state treasurer, our state treasurer who said he's gonna stand strong against any effort at all uh, to, to look at these issues. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately with the current budget situation, the governor had to, to veto that, um, veto that, that task force and the business plan that was being created. Um, I look forward to seeing, what that, seeing that business plan and I'm not gonna stand in the way of that. Uh, in the way that the, uh, the the current state treasurer has, and uh, so you know, I, I've consistently supported Senator Kuder's approach. That that approach has been supported by Senator Hasegawa, uh, Senator Wynn, uh, and others, and then obviously the, the majority of the legislature. Um, and it's it's particularly concerning that the, the state treasurer has tried to repeat, repeatedly block that. And, and you know, I, I look forward to seeing 
a business plan that, that by all indication would be identifying a situation to do this where it's not putting pension Ten dollars seconds. at risk in any way and uh, you know, find a path to allow for that infrastructure investment. Great, thank you. Uh, Mackenzie, question two? Sure. Uh, there's three questions here. So uh, first is, how can we improve the economy and economic security for all people? How do we grow the number of good paying jobs in Washington? And how do you view wealth and income inequality and what would you do about it, if anything? Sure. Well, let's start, start with the last question first, because I think issues of income inequality are really one of the driving forces to so many of the challenges uh, that we're seeing. I mean, and we're seeing it play out that much more now in light of the, the recent uh, pandemic and issues surrounding that, um, you know, whether it's issues of health care, whether it's issues of, of retirement security, uh, all of those issues um, are coming to light that much more and it's all tied in income inequality. And so we need to be doing uh, all that we can to be, uh, you know, addressing uh, issues, to, that, that issues to address that. Um, you know, and one of the, the first things that we can be doing related to that is making sure that um, we, we actually first recognize that it's, that it's a problem. You know, I have a run against an incumbent who uh, has attended Freedom Foundation Washington Policy Center uh, events where he has been a panelist speaker right before uh, Governor Scott Walker spoke. Um, and he has taken a firm position that he is uh, the current treasurer that is, that he will oppose any issues around uh, any discussion of, of new revenue sources, um, which is contrary to what he told uh, all of the Democratic organizations, which is contrary to what he told Labor, and it's contrary to what he put into his voters' guide um, in in 2016 when he first uh, when he first ran, which is that he would not seek a, an agenda of this sort. Well, I think the the agenda we that should be addressed is is how can we fight more for working families and retired folks? It's one of the things I have done consistently. Uh, since joining the legislature uh, in 2016. Um, it's one of the things seconds. that I'm able to do uh, because I don't take any corporate donations. And, um, you know, and I, I apologize because I, I missed the first two parts of the question other than it's all, it's all tied to income inequality when we're dealing with improving the economy. Great, thank you. Uh, Laura, question three, please. Do you support a just transition to deal with climate change, such as the Green New Deal, which would bring carbon emissions down to zero in the next decade or two, while investing in those most impacted, who are often low-income, marginalized communities of color? Sure. So let me talk about what the Treasurer's Office can do. Um, certainly, in the legislature, I've uh, consistently supported all uh, environmental uh, policies that, that advance and address issues of climate change and, and other issues. Uh, but specifically, here's why I'm excited about the Treasurer's Office and, and specifically what the Treasurer's Office can do. We can do something called shareholder engagement. And what that means is, is because we have ownership stake in various companies around the country, and because other states do as well as a part of the pension dollars, we can team up with other like-minded states, states like Oregon, New, uh, California, New York, New Jersey, I could go on. And because of that ownership stake, have a significant ownership percentage of certain companies. And folks can protest outside of those corporate boardrooms all they want. Well, the corporate boards have a fiduciary obligation to shareholders and no one else. Well, we are shareholders and we have a long-term interest in that company. And what I mean by that is it's not a short-term profit. It's not how do they maximize um, their energy, you know, invest in non-renewable fuels, for example, or fossil fuels. Um, it, it's what is the long-term interest. And a lot of these companies have identified long-term, 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now, we have to address climate change for that business to be viable. And what we can do is because we're long-term owners, team up together with these other states and do uh, these issue statements and, and essentially call upon those corporate boards to take much quicker uh, and immediate systemic actions to address climate change Ten seconds. in a way that, Sorry, that can be done seconds. a lot more. And we can do the same thing uh, on issues of diversity in terms of corporate board makeup, which I'd be happy to talk about too if I have, have more time. Great, thank you. Uh, question for uh, Sherry. Hey, um, number four, will you support efforts to combat the economic impacts of systemic racism by supporting policies that target inequality in areas like housing, education, and intergenerational wealth? Great. Um, you know, again, something else that, you know, the legislature that I've been a, a, a committed and consistent uh, supporter of, but again, this is a good transition in terms of talking specifically what I'm excited about doing as treasurer and how the treasurer can really address systemic 
reforms uh, in a very uh, significant and quick way. Um, it's something we're not used to here in Washington. You know, when you have a Trump supporting Republican state treasurer, uh, it comes as no shock that that, that isn't being done. Um, but what I can say is uh, not too long ago, it was actually, uh, you know, our, our Democratic state treasurer was, was, was working on these issues himself, who was a former representative of the 36th legislative district, um, is go in as shareholders and start changing the makeup of corporate boards. So when we're talking about environmental reforms, when we talk about the effect corporations have in marginalized communities and voiceless communities. Well, that will change if, you, if the boards better reflect the communities that are impacted by, cor by corporate policies. Um, right now, le less than 20% of women on, on S&P 1500 corporate boards are women. Less than 20% are women on those, uh, on those, in those companies. A similar percentage among Fortune 500 companies. One of the things I am going to do as state treasurer um, is I will not support a slate of, of candidates for a corporate board of directors that we have uh, stock in that is not at least, at least 30% women. And across the board, consistently with every proxy seconds. vote that I have as treasurer. And so when we talk about systemic reform, these are things that we can do if we follow the money. It doesn't, it, it shouldn't be a surprise. It shouldn't take years. It shouldn't take just pipelines. While that's important to work on the pipeline, we can bring about systemic reform right away with the right policies. And once we get rid of our Trump supporting incumbent. Great, thank you. Uh, so now we'll move into uh, follow-up questions and the responses to these are one minute apiece. And I'm going to go ahead and open that up to everyone. If you have a follow-up question, please raise your hand or post it into the chat box. All right, follow-up questions. Sometimes it takes that's, a while. that's the effect of the treasurer's race. It just puts everyone to sleep, I think. It's, uh, I, but, but I'm excited by it. <laughs> well, I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about changing the makeup of corporate boards. Do you want to go into a little bit more detail on how you do yeah. that? No, ab absolutely. And it's, it's one of the things that's a perfect example of um, you know, how conservatives have consistently controlled power bases. And you know, you know Mitch McConnell, uh, there was an article in uh, in the Atlantic about a week or two ago, and, and certainly a significant coverage about how um, there's been a, a conservative movement underway uh, for years, recognizing that they're worried about losing their power in Congress. And so they've moved into obviously stacking the judiciary with as many conservative judges as they can, but also creating obviously, you know, various federal laws that will be put in place in, in a way that long term they can control things. And the next wave of that is gonna be how uh, current budget issues affect states. And you see a lot of states that have not fully funded their pensions in the way that they should. And a lot of states that there's been a push by people like Senator McConnell uh, and seconds. others oh, to, to call on these states to uh, declare bankruptcy. And with the, the effort to make it so the federal government then has owner, ownership and control over the laws that impact um, how they reorganize. And so these next, these next 10 years are going to be significantly impacted by how we address these policies. You know, Elizabeth Warren knows that, uh, Katie Porter knows that, and we need to, to, to get ahead of the times here in Washington State and change this position. Great, thank you. Um, I see Jason and then Lori. Uh, yes, uh, the treasurer uh, chairs two uh, boards. Can you kind of describe uh, some of the um, initiatives or uh, roles that that you can play to uh, guide our state? Yeah, sure, no, thanks for the question. Actually, you know, while there are certain boards that are, that are chaired by the treasurer, treasurer serves on several other boards that, that are really critical to how we do our investments, how we manage our debt, um, how, how we address, you know, a range of uh, economic issues. So when we got the question earlier from, from Mackenzie, um, you know, in terms of issues of how we address our economy, well, it comes as no surprise. I mean, we, we can uh, readdress our economy and, and, and look at how we invest our resources in a way that help working families and retired folks, um, or we can put it on the backs of, or it's either, they, either working families and retired folks who are left holding the bag, um, or co corporations uh, are gonna, gonna profit. And um, I think it's, it's, it's incredible that, it's incredibly important that we have someone in this position who is always looking out for working families and retired individuals. And all the policies we do on all those seconds. committees that we're doing it in a way that, that is, is prudent and solvent, making sure we're doing what we, we need to in terms of good fiscal management. But, but when there are decisions and policy decisions to be made that we're advocating for what's in the best interest of working families and retired people. Great, thank you. Uh, Lori? 
Hey, thanks. I, um, I'm very interested in what you're saying about how we can use our position as shareholder um, to move corporate boards. That's a, a really unique approach I have not heard of before. Are there other uh, things like that, other strategies or tactics that as treasurer you might be able to, to put into play to get results? Yeah, sure. Well, I, th I think, um, you know, like was being pointed out with the, the last question is the, the treasurer, you know, sits in a range of different positions. And, and, and in most situations, and appropriately so, the treasurer has an ob obligation to either be maximizing certain financial returns um, under the law or having some other fiduciary responsibility or obligation to make sure we're being prudent and responsible. But I, I cannot emphasize enough that the same way conservatives over the last 20 to 30 years um, started working to change the, the majorities of state legislatures, knowing that the majorities of state legislatures, especially in other states, would be controlling gerrymandering and setting up of Congress. And only now, 20 to 30 years later, we're dealing with the consequences of what they knew was coming with that. Um, the, the next wave is going to be how we handle issues of debt, how we, you know, whether there are issues of bankruptcy in states, and how we handle uh, issues of our state finances. And look, there are not that many, uh, there are not enough state treasurers who are Democrats. Um, and if we're going to be addressing these issues appropriately in a state like Washington, we sure as heck need to make sure we have one. So over the next five to 10 years, uh, we're, we're dealing with these issues the right way. Great. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Hi, so basically, um, we've alluded a couple times this evening to um, the ever elusive Office of Treasurer of Washington State for the Democrats. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you could fill us in a little bit on your strategy to win. So I, I actually have some good news, which is in the last 90 years, in the last 90 years, only once in the last 90 years has a Republican beat a Democrat in the state of Washington for state treasurer, only once. And that was in 1952, when uh, during the Eisenhower Republican wave of 52, the Republican won by a little less than half a point, or a little less than a point. Um, obviously, four years ago, kind of gave us an accidental treasurer. Um, you know, we had the two Republicans went on because of the top two system. And um, this, is a, this is a position we, 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 should, we should win, but it's never easy to be an incumbent. I can say that firsthand, having run against an incumbent. Um, it takes organization. One of the things I'm, I'm pleased with and, and with the support of so many active members of the 36 and others uh, throughout the state, um, we've been able to unite the party in a way to, to make sure that we can be organized, raise the funds we need to, despite not taking any corporate donations, and, and be ready to take on, uh, take on an incumbent. But it's tough because it's a position people don't, don't pay attention to, but it's so impactful, and we need to make sure I'm going to count on so many organizations like this to get the word out how important this is. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jeff. Uh, yeah, Mike, so given what happened in 2016, where we had three Democrats running and two Republicans running, um, do you or would you support ranked choice voting and, and using this as an example to remind people of that policy option? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the first time I've gotten that question, but I don't know why I haven't really? thought about it until now. It's a, uh, it's a, <laughs> it's a great, great question. Well, what I can say, what I can say is this, you know, I've, I've been the, the vice chair of our state uh, government committee, the state government elections committee in the house, and uh, I actually voted to, to, uh, to uh, begin the process of looking at ranked choice voting uh, so that local municipalities can uh, start, uh, uh, start doing some pilot projects if they choose to in municipal races. I've always thought that you know, ranked choice voting works. Um, once people understand it, uh, it works uh, because people know it's more, more fair. Um, the problem is people need to know how it works, otherwise it doesn't necessarily look fair. Um, and so, you know, it's one of those things that's gonna be a long process, but, but they, actually, I can't believe I haven't thought about that until now, it's actually really <laughs> well, it's 52% combined for the Democrats and 48 yes. for the Republicans, yes. yet the Republicans yes. got the seat, so. Yes, yeah, yeah, can't, can't argue with you. Great. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we are exactly at almost, well, almost exactly at 19 uh, minutes. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to uh, give a one minute uh, wrap up. Great. Well, look, in 2016, um, when I ran a, a campaign without any corporate donations, 
um, people were kind of questioning me and didn't think I could win. Um, you know, more shockingly is after I did win, after personally knocking on over 15,000 doors, um, you know, I continued to not take corporate donations. And, and that was much more difficult to do because checks just started showing up in the mail without me asking for them. Um, they called it makeup money. Um, well, I returned all that makeup money and I, and I really am excited to see what's now catching on, uh, which is running campaigns without corporate money. And I want to show um, that we can do that at the state level, um, statewide level. And I cannot think of any position where it's more critical um, than having clean hands and not having those corporate entanglements for the position of state treasurer when we're talking about these investments. Because this is what's going to, when seconds. you're running, it, it's a position like this that allows for me now to do that shareholder engagement in a way because I know it's in the long-term interest of, of our ownership stake and in the interest of the state of Washington. And so I'm, I'm really excited about the position. I could do it uh, with your help. Great, thank you.